Hi, this is Jacob Hornberger, President of the Future of Freedom Foundation, joined by Sheldon Richmond, the Vice President of the Foundation. This is the Libertarian Angle, the show that brings you the burning issues of the day, but with a libertarian analysis, the kind of analysis that we all know you're not going to get in the mainstream press or certainly not on the uh, mainstream television networks. Sheldon, you know, I notice that we're having a spate of uh, immigration deaths that are taking place, immigration-related deaths. Uh, there were some 300 people that died on uh, in the ocean outside of Italy, and now there's uh, there's more deaths taking place in Texas as people try to come into the country illegally. Now, I find this really fascinating that, that you have all these people that are status, especially in Europe, but I mean, obviously here in the United States too, that purport to love the poor and the needy and the disadvantaged, and that's why they love Medicare and Obamacare and, you know, the whole welfare state. And, of course, you know, it's ten times worse in Europe with respect to the welfare state and how they claim to love the poor. And yet all these statists love these immigration controls that inevitably end up with these kind of disasters. And um, I find it interesting that the statists never take responsibility for it. I mean, they are indirectly responsible because they favor these controls that inevitably give rise to these disasters. I think it's just part of the hypocrisy that pervades the status movement. What do you think? Yeah, I, I can't think of a more inhumane policy than immigration restrictions. Uh, you know, of course, we, you and I, and uh, other FFF authors have written about this for for years and years and years. We're long on the record on this. Uh, I guess you, there's a book that's a collection of some of those articles. Uh, Brian Kaplan at George Mason University is another person who hits very hard at this. I know we spoke at an FFF sponsored event, and he really does stress the inhumanity, not just the the, the rights aspect of it, which is, seems to me obvious, but just the inhumanity. And the example he uses is imagine telling the people of Haiti or telling a Haitian individual, uh, you know, by law you are now confined to the Haitian labor market. Sorry, but that's that's the breaks, but that's it. You you cannot get into the American labor market, and of course other countries are doing the same thing, so you can't get in and out. That's your life that's your life's lot, and we're gonna make sure it never changes. You are confined to Haiti. That is inhumane. Imagine it just imagine it. I mean it's a terrible thing to tell someone. It's a tremendously poor country because of uh, you know very bad public policy, and so uh, there there's not the uh, usual market-driven uh, or what we would expect a market-driven accumulation of wealth and capital, which then lets people become more productive and earn higher uh, uh, incomes and be able to buy more goods. Uh, and but okay, you know it's too bad they have those policies, and it's it would be good if those those policies got changed. But that's no reason for us to say we're just we're going to confine you there. But it's essentially like putting troops around the country and their country and saying you know, nobody's getting out. It's the equivalent of that. That's cruel. I can't think of a more cruel policy than immigration restriction. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, and and we have been saying this for many many years here at FFF. In fact, one of our books is entitled "The Case for Free Trade and Open Immigration." And the reason we we tie in free trade and open immigration is we simply believe in open borders, the the right of people to cross borders in search of a better life, or to tour, to invest, to visit family, to visit friends, whatever. I mean, you know, why shouldn't people be free to do that? It just it, it befuddles me that status are so insistent on having, you know, armed guards at the border. And, of course, uh, down where I grew up in Texas and all along the southwest, you now have armed guards within the United States. Uh, you know, the immigration checkpoints domestically. Uh, where a person just traveling inside the United States has to stop and show his papers and prove that he's a citizen. And, and of course, the darker-skinned people always get it worse. They've got to carry their passports when they travel here domestically because of those checkpoints. And I, I find it so interesting that statists claim to love the poor, the needy, and the disadvantaged, and they take this position. I just read a, an article, a, a critique of libertarians by a, a leftist. I forget where I saw it, but on one of the leftist websites. And he, he takes us to task because we oppose the welfare state. You know, how could you be so mean to the poor as to oppose the welfare state? Uh, but he doesn't bring up immigration at all. 
I mean, because this is this is the part that they can never explain, that they favor immigration controls, and those controls inevitably end up with death or abuse of people. I mean, you've written on how uh, the the immigration controls result in tremendous exploitation of people. You know how you the the employer can threaten to turn the the employees in if they if they don't agree to certain conditions, and so they they live under this oppressive environment of being turned in or ferreted out or caught. Sometimes after years of living here, uh, where they where they're deported and told you can't ever come back. Uh, so it is an inhumane system, and it, it's it's a system that really is antithetical to poor people. It says to poor people, we don't give a darn for you. You know, we'll we'll go abroad in search of 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 oppressive conditions, and we'll bomb uh, your countries, and we'll kill uh, many of you in in the attempt to really help you, you know, like we did in Iraq and so forth. But oh, heaven forbid! The libertarian notion of letting you come and live here in the United States, we don't love you that much. <laughs> yeah, that's what it comes down to, and I think we really have to uh, uh, hammer that home and uh, make that point over and over again, especially against the uh, so-called progressives who, who uh, try to portray us as somehow callous because w- we don't believe in a you know government dole, but believe in mutual aid and voluntary association. But this is this is the epitome of voluntary association, free movement. Uh, the other thing that uh, kind of goals me is that you have people who are, uh, you know, maybe all of the respects libertarian, uh, claiming that open borders uh, can't be right because uh, somehow it, it violates property rights. I mean, I've been in a sort of a running uh, debate, debate with someone on uh, Twitter who holds himself out to be a uh, libertarian realist. It's kind of his title, title for himself, who says, I'm, I'm wrong because certainly – if I believe in rights, then people have people as a nation have a right, he says, to decide who comes into the nation. And I, I'm f- flabbergasted because uh, what's that going to do with libertarian property rights? <laughs> that that, that a na- somehow the people as a nation now have a right. Uh, what about my right to bring someone on my property to work and live or whatever or visit uh, whatever I want, uh, uh, who uh, you know has a passport from another country? Uh, that sounds very collectivist to say, well, because the nation decided that that person can't come here and live, even on my own property, that somehow that's a, that uh, gets a clean bill of health from, you know, from a libertarian point of view. Uh, some libertarians have a real blind spot on this issue. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, you know, imagine what life would be like if there were open borders, the same type of life that we have basically here in the United States, except for those domestic passport checks in the uh, in the Southwest, I mean, people cross borders back and forth. They don't you know, like here between Maryland and Virginia. Uh, they, nobody keeps track. Nobody worries about you know Marylanders stealing jobs from Virginians or selling more than what they're buying, and none of that nonsense. So imagine if if the borders were open. People from Mexico could simply cross the international bridge like normal human beings. They wouldn't have to trespass on farms and ranches anymore. They'd take a bus or an airplane north. And we don't see, you know, immigrants sleeping on public parks or, or on public roads. They're, they're invited into private establishments. They rent places to live. They, they go to work for private businesses. That's where all the immigration busts are. And this notion, you know, here's another canard where they say, oh, you don't believe in borders. You don't believe in borders. That's ridiculous. Simply because people are, are free to cross a border doesn't mean that a border disappears. The border remains, just like the border between Virginia and Maryland remains, despite the fact that people are crossing back and forth. It's the same thing that would happen internationally. Yeah, I mean, you know, when it comes to people's everyday activities, uh, the, the only reason they even have to notice the borders is the, go- the government's in the way. Right, either uh, with checkpoints and demanding papers and things like that. But you know, people trade across the uh, the Mexican-American border uh, routinely, just like they trade across the Canadian border. Uh, they wouldn't pay any attention to it if the government weren't there checking papers. Uh, and so they're, you know, in a sense, they're not meaningful to people's real lives. It's just that the politicians get in the way and either, you know, as as usual, stick their nose in other other people's business. Uh, I, I agree with what you say that uh, commerce brings people together, and there's, there's plenty of reason to think 
that uh, with with uh, open borders, people property owners in the United States would would, would welcome uh, people who don't have American passports uh, to to the sh- these shores for uh, all kinds of reasons. They rent, they sell property, they uh, and then they are looking for employees, and uh, you know commerce brings people together and and sort of uh, uh, blurs. Those differences, which become important when government, uh, and, you know, erects barriers to, to commerce. Well, there's another interesting twist to this too, and that's that's what goes on in terms of foreign policy. I mean, I mentioned, you know, the bombs and the invasions and so forth that kill so many people uh, that are poor people. I mean, I'd venture to say that most of the people in Iraq who were killed were poor. And uh, certainly most of the people in Afghanistan that have been killed have been poor. But look what they're doing to Iran. Now, here, there's no declaration of war against Iran, and they have this, this ever-tightening system of sanctions. And what did U.S. officials say? They, they, they said the same thing they, they always say about sanctions. Oh, it's only going to target government officials. We're, we're only trying to get government officials to change their policy. Well, that's not what's happening. It's never what part of their intention. What's happening is there is a stranglehold on the Iranian people themselves. That it, it's, 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 it's sending these people into total impoverishment. And it, I mean, you can imagine what's happening to the people at the bottom of the economic ladder in Iran, uh, because the people that are in the middle class and wealthy are losing their fortunes. And it's not like anybody's surprised about this, because this is exactly what they did in Iraq. Uh, and ultimately, of course, the people that bore the biggest brunt in Iraq, Iraq were the children that were dying in mass uh, as a result of starvation, illness, and so forth. But you can see the desperation that's now taking place in Iran, that they're, they're not only hurting the poor, they're sending more people into poverty in the hopes that the citizenry will then squeeze the government into uh, changing its policy. Well, how can you profess to love the poor when you've got this this system that does so much damage to poor people, right, and it doesn't usually work out that uh, way anyway. And uh, in the overwhelming number of cases with economic sanctions, sanctions, it, it tends to force people uh, or prompt people to rally around, you know, the government they live under, and uh, and you know, for, forgive the. Uh, uh, oppressiveness, uh, if they're aware of it, uh, because they see there's an external enemy, and you know most people's first thought is we have to fight off this external enemy, and they look they look to the government to, to do that. So it, it doesn't even accomplish that. Uh, I really, yeah, I'm really peeved whenever the uh, the politicians and also the the, the press the media talk about how uh, you know the damage, the, the crippling damage the uh, sanctions are doing to the Iranian economy. Well, you know, the economy is not something you can cripple or damage. The economy is an abstraction. It refers to people and their activities. So when you talk about crippling an economy, you talk, you're talking about harming people. You're keeping medicine and, and food and other things, important things, sanitation, supplies, or spare parts uh, away from people, and it, hurt, it hurts them. Or you end up forcing the prices so high that you, you, you hurt the, obviously hurt the most vulnerable uh, people in that society. So uh, the sanitized language of, uh, yes, we'll, we'll inflict the, uh, da- a damage on the economy is ridiculous. People should think about what happens when, you know, quote, our economy is damaged. Real people suffer. Real people lose jobs or, you know, lose money they've saved, which d- dissipates with uh, the loss of value of the, of the currency. Uh, that's harming real people. And what they've done with Iran is to cut, uh, you know, the Iranian uh, uh, central bank off from the and others, other Iranians off from the international finance system. So even where they haven't specifically banned something, they'll say, "Well, wait a second, medicine is exempt." But if you keep the, um, uh, the Iranians from having access to the international finance system, which is what they've done, uh, you don't need to ban specific products. They can't get them because they don't have. No one will trade with them, and they uh, they can't, uh, you know, they can't do the normal things that uh, that people uh, do because of because of this. And you know, as bad as it is, there are people in Congress who want sanctions even worse. They want even harsher sanctions, uh, even even with the, uh, the Iranians making the overtures that they're making now. Uh, there are people who don't want to take yes for an answer, don't want to deal with the Iranians even if they're willing to make big concessions, and want harsher and harsher sanctions because I think what they ultimately want is war. I believe they, I believe they want war and regime change with Iran. 
Uh, oh, that's what we have to watch for there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the ultimate goal. Uh, you know, you can they can disguise it in terms of, oh, nuclear facilities and all WMDs like they did with Iraq. But the fact is they want regime change there. Just like they got regime change in 1953 when they went in there and they ousted uh, the prime minister of the country, the CIA did, uh, Mohammed Mossadegh, and they installed their man, the Shah of Iran, or reinstalled him into power, helped him uh, torture his citizens, oppress his citizens until the Iranian people finally revolted in 1979, and uh, the U.S. has never gotten over it. They want their man in power there, and that's what this is all about. In fact, another good example of this phenomenon is Cuba. Um, you know, we've had this embargo, which is really sanctions there, uh, for, what, 50 years or so? Uh, more than 50 years. And uh, what's been its goal? Regime change. That's, that's what the goal was from the beginning. They had this obsession with putting their man into power in, in Cuba. And, and, you know, several years ago, I went to Cuba, and I, and I saw how difficult life is for these people. I mean, they're the nicest people in the world. I, I've never met nicer people anywhere than just the Cuban people, generally speaking. And um, and I once asked uh, a taxi driver, I said, how come you're so nice to me after what my government has done to you in terms of the embargo? And his answer was very interesting. He said, why should I hold you responsible for what your government has done to us? And uh, but there are people struggling there. Now, part of it, obviously, is because of Cuba's socialist system. This is what statists here in the United States don't realize, that, that socialism produces impoverishment. It hurts poor people. But but it's like a uh, the two sides of a vice that, that are squeezing the Cuban people. You've got the embargo and then you've got the socialism. What we libertarians say is open the borders. Let there be free commerce and free movements of people. That's the best thing we could ever do to help the poor people of, of Cuba. You know, why fight socialism with more socialism? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, and people the world over make this distinction between the American people and the, and the, and the U.S. government. Uh, that's not uh, that's pretty common. It seems to be only Americans who don't make the distinction between uh, a people uh, and their government, including including the Americans. So, uh, you know, we get upset if, uh, if somebody uh, insults uh, the president of the United States. We're supposed to all take it as a as a, you know an insult to us. Uh, I think when uh, when uh, um, the, uh, the the late president of, uh, of Venezuela uh, was at the UN and called George Bush uh, the, the devil or something. Uh, the, uh, all the, the reporters on TV were taking umbrage as if their father or mother had been insulted by some you know, bully. And uh, I, was, I remember chuckling and saying, who, who cares if he stands up and calls George Bush? We're going to go to war over that? <laughs> you know, there was another place they wanted to have regime change with uh, Hugo Chavez uh, and now his successor. Uh, yeah, I don't understand why people get upset at things like this, but, uh, but I agree with you. We've, we've been at war with the Cuban people for all those years, over 50 years, like you said, uh, and, and why? And why? I mean, if, if we'd been trading all this time, maybe so their socialism would have broken down because of uh, yeah. the, 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 the steady visiting of people. Uh, there was an old essay years ago that the old the Foundation for Economic Education uh, published uh, in the 50s called uh, In Favor of Red Trade. I don't think it was the exact title. Uh, that was a big issue back then. You know, the American companies shouldn't be allowed to tra trade with communist countries. And uh, the old fee types, you know, uh, Dean Russell and those types, were arguing that that's, uh, that's a self-defeating policy because when people bring goods into a country like Russia or Cuba, they're doing more than that. They're bringing more than the physical goods. They're, they're, be, they're there, and people see the, the cut of their clothes, where they talk to them and learn something about the United States. And that plants thoughts of, uh, hey, we could have something better. We could, we could, maybe we could, uh, you know, we're learning that markets, uh, you know, make things pretty uh, good. Why don't we, why don't we try that? It can, it can be subversive. Trade with, with a country that, uh, you know, is, uh, is the socialist country can, can be subversive because ideas always go with people. Wherever you, wherever they uh, travel, so uh, that's a lesson. Of course, the policymakers have never uh, been willing to learn because they they make too much uh, capitalizing on the uh, the alternative point of view that there's you know there's this demon out there that we always need an enemy, right? There's the demon we have to keep from the, the barbarians, you know, from the gates, 
And, um, you know, they wouldn't embrace this view that we're, we're talking about because it doesn't serve their interests. It's not that they're stupid and can't learn the lesson. They have no incentive to learn the lesson. Yeah, that's a fascinating point about the subversive aspect of, uh, of, of economic liberty on our side. Because when I was in Cuba, one of the guys I was talking to, who was one of the reformers, he's very libertarian, and he said to me that if the U.S. were to open up its borders, it would be Fidel Castro's worst nightmare. Because then he would have to decide, oh my gosh, should I let this flood of Americans into my, into my island, which can then be used to subvert uh, the, the people in Cuba. And as, as you said, that you not only bring in your money, you bring in your ideas and your philosophy and people start learning about you. This is why the totalitarian dictators in North Korea do everything they can to isolate their citizenry from the rest of the world. Because as they see the rest of the world, they start asking, why can't we have that too? Why are we different? Why are we living here in poverty? And, and then the other thing that we ought to be thinking about is that these controls are controls on, on the American people. They are a violation of our freedom. When, when the government threatens to put me in jail because I'm going to Cuba and spending my money there, that's a violation of our fundamental rights. And so it's easy to portray this thing as, oh, sanctions on Iran and sanctions on Cuba and so forth. But really, a lot of them are sanctions on us. The, the government is imposing the same type of controls on us that those totalitarian regimes or authoritarian regimes are installing them on their citizens. Yeah, and of course, uh, we should keep in mind the other side of that, too, is that the foreign dictator, it's, it's very convenient for the dictator to blame his own failings on the, you know, the economic policies of the United States. So the Castros have been able to do this for a very long time. And I'm sure the uh, you know, other dictators have done it, too. Uh, and, you know, most people don't, Understand economics well enough to, you know, to be sure whether, you know, what, whether that's true or not. But it's very convenient for Castro to be saying, uh, w you know, we'd be rich or so our socialism would work if it wasn't for the U.S. But you're right. Maybe secretly he doesn't want the, he didn't want the U.S. to lift the, uh, lift those, uh, that embargo. Uh, it's a cynical game all the way around, and sometimes, you know, it's easy to, it's, it's almost easy to slip into a conspiracy theory that all these dictators and, and so-called leaders are all working together against us, all the peoples of the world. It's us against them. Well, you're right. And in fact, Castro has made a big propaganda deal out of the, out of the embargo, which he calls the blockade. Uh, where he says that this, all of the Cuba's economic problems are caused by the United States. And so it's the perfect cover for the failure of his socialist system. You just blame it on the U.S. embargo. Well, if the embargo were lifted, which it should be immediately, I mean, this thing's ridiculous. Cold War's over. <laughs> the U.S. is trading with Vietnam. Uh, then yeah. Castro would no longer have any, have any excuse as to the failures of his system. And then peep, Americans would be free to flood the, the islands with money and ideas and philosophy and books and whatever. Be fantastic. Be the best way to advance yeah. freedom in all these countries. Yeah, so what you just said really just cast light on how absurd this all is. Uh, the, the Cold War is long over. The Soviet Union is long gone. The uh, Americans are allowed to trade with the Vietnamese. Uh, and so there's still this embargo on the Cubans. And this shows you how foreign policy and domestic policy are very tightly intertwined. Because you have to ask yourself, you know, would the embargo have be still be on if it weren't for presidential politics in the state of Florida? Uh, which sounds like it's far removed, except it isn't. Because there's an older generation of Cubans who, you know, have not forgiven Castro. And I, I don't mind them having, you know, having animosity to Castro. A lot of them fled their homes because, because Castro had a brutal you know, regime. And it, it's, it's hardly improved, of course. Uh, so it was, it's not so much I blame them, but politicians are afraid to say this is a, this is crazy to maintain this embargo because they don't want to lose the state of Florida. And that, as we know from the 2000 election, uh, that can be a very important state in presidential politics. So that that's being driven. Now, as I understand it, the, the younger generation of Cubans in Florida, Cuban-Americans, don't uh, feel the same way that their parents did. Their parents are getting older, so this may, be, this may change, but it does illustrate the tight uh, connection between foreign policy and domestic policy. 
Oh, absolutely, especially where one small little contingent can control the whole thing uh, by virtue of where they are and what state they happen to be located in. But, you know, bringing up Cuba is an interesting thing uh, in light of how we start out this conversation because, you know, Cuba is, I think everybody would agree, is a socialist country. And, and you know, what does that mean? It, you know, it means that most everybody works for the government. I mean, it has this concept of equality, you know, the type of thing that the statists love, the, the leftists here in America, you know, equality of opportunity. And you've got Medicare there and Medicaid. you got free health care for everybody. And you got free education all the way through college, you know, so you got public schooling, stuff that the leftists and, and conservatives love too. And, uh, and yet everybody's mired in poverty. And, and of course, you know, leftists might say, well, that's because of the embargo. But, you know, we all, we also know as libertarians that it's because of their socialist system. And, and I think it serves a valuable lesson to what, what we're talking about over here in terms of where, you know, I said that leftists attack us. Uh, that for hating the poor because we oppose these welfare state programs. It, it's simply that we libertarians have a better understanding of economic principles and wealth creation and how you help poor people than liberals do. I mean, I, I have often said liberals have a woeful lack of understanding when it comes to economics. And, uh, you know, we say if you can create a dynamic, prosperous, booming society in terms of economic principles, that's the best way to help the poor. Because now the poor have a chance to become wealthy as compared to the welfare state where the attitude is lock the poor out of the labor market, like with things like regulations and high taxes and minimum wage laws, put them on welfare and claim that you're helping them out. And so I, th- I think that all this thing starts to come together, not just in terms of, of immigration, free trade, but also in terms of the importance of capital and economic liberty in the lives of people all across the spectrum, but especially those at the bottom of the economic ladder. Yeah, I think one thing that lets the, uh, uh, the so-called progressives uh, get away with that uh, by accusing us of being, you know, anti-poor, is that uh, too much of what they hear they, 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 uh, is is the is the uh, libertarian part of the military message that that attacks, you know, so the so-called w- the welfare state sort of measures, uh, food stamps or uh, uh, WIC, you know, uh, which is w- sort of welfare for w- w- women with young children and infants, uh, and the older uh, New Deal era uh, aid dependent children, which which then uh, changed in the in the nineties, so they put a few more rules on it. So they, they hear a lot of libertarian criticism of of that stuff, what we generally call the dole uh, or Medicaid as, as well, which goes to tends to go to low income people. But what they don't hear enough of, you know, for one thing, they filter it out. But also libertarians need to stress it more, is all the privilege side of what we're objecting to. Uh, see, the way I see it, and way, you know, I think the way a lot of libertarians see this, is that those, uh, those handouts are sort of secondary ameliorative measures. Uh, the system is being run in a way that's really a system of privilege for people who already sort of got theirs, and now they protect it from, uh, 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 from competition. But that creates hardship for people because it, there's fewer opportunities for self-employment thanks to licensing and land restrictions. And so uh, in order to keep uh, people who are now suffering these hardships from maybe getting uh, ideas of, ri- of rising up and putting an end to it, they throw them some bones. The, the ruling class throws them some bones, which is the dole. So if you only complain about the dole but not complain about all the privileges, then it's a lopsided message because they, they don't hear libertarians saying, well, we've got to get rid of all the privileges too. No, uh, all the barriers to uh, individual economic advancement, which would exist in a, in a free society, in a free market, but don't exist under the current uh, corporatist system. So, uh, it, you know, I think it's partly selective hearing on the, on the, uh, on the part of the uh, progressives, but I think it's also partly uh, libertarians don't get, they give enough em- emphasis to the privilege side of it. And uh, I think we really need to do some more work in that area. I couldn't agree with you more, and especially like all these uh, corporate privileges and the government business partnerships, uh, the, the the defense establishment uh, that's that's really just part of the dole. That all of these things that are protecting the the existing firms, the big companies, the big corporations from the competition 
of upstarts and people that would start up new businesses that are at the bottom of the economic ladder, that would hire their friends uh, and work at sub-minimum wages, um, that, that all of those little privileges, taxes and regulations that keep the established firms in business, we libertarians hate this kind of system. And that, that kind of shocks progressives sometimes. They think that we just stand for, oh, you guys are all pro-Wall Street and stuff. We have stood consistently against the fact that Wall Street is in in bed with the politicians in Washington and they've got all their little bailouts and their special privileges together. What we really want is a separation of business in the state, a separation of economy in the state, where everybody is treated the same and where people at the bottom of the economic ladder have opportunities to open up business, start businesses, and outcompete the people that have already made it. Anyway, Sheldon, I think uh, our time's up. Uh, that's the Libertarian Angle for this week. Hope you enjoyed the show. Come and visit us at FFF.org. We've got a great um, college tour that Sheldon and I are doing next month in the southeast. If you're in the area, come and uh, attend. It's not just limited to, to college students. We're doing it in conjunction with the Young Americans for Liberty at five college campuses. And guess what? We're going to be doing the Libertarian Angle there at these college campuses. And so if you're in the area, the whole schedule is on our website at fff.org or subscribe to our FFF daily and you'll get the full schedule there. Love to have you join us. And in any event, thanks for the great support you've shown us because it's through your support that we're able to do this program and all the other programs we do. So thanks so much and uh, we'll see you next time.